grace to you and peace from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. What a day we're having. Here we are on this Pentecost Sunday. Most years, Pentecost falls when we're into the month of June. But today, it's only mid-May. We haven't seen the cicadas yet, have we? A little bit here and there, yeah. I know Elmhurst is covered with them. I conducted an outdoor service on Pentecost one year. It was ironic because the wind kept blowing my papers around that day. The spirit shows up. It's been seven weeks since Easter, but maybe for some of us it feels like it hasn't been that long. Pentecost was originally a Jewish holiday, the harvest festival, the festival of weeks, Shavuot, which was celebrated 50 days after Passover. During this festival, all practicing Jews would gather together in Jerusalem to worship and celebrate God's good gifts. Later on, Pentecost also celebrated the giving of the Law of Moses at Mount Sinai. Every year on Pentecost Sunday, we have the same readings from Acts, the giving of the Spirit in Jerusalem, and our gospel comes from John. Even as it's familiar, even as we hear it every year, the Spirit is drawing me towards the Acts reading. Because every year the Spirit gets up to something different and blows in different directions and highlights different pieces for us. And so we gather together in one place, in one spirit, just as the apostles did the first Christian Pentecost. I can't help but wonder, what was it like that day the Holy Spirit filled the entire house they were sitting in? What does a violent wind from heaven sound like? Is it like a tornado or a giant flock of birds? Was it howling like it says in the common English Bible? What even are divided tongues of fire? When all were filled with the Holy Spirit, did it feel like their lungs were inflated with a big breath? Were they shocked and maybe a little scared when their actual tongues were making words they'd never actually practiced speaking? One question, as I said in the children's sermon, that I often ask of this scene is, when did they go outside? I picture the Holy Spirit wind practically picking them up, carrying them out of the upper room, out of their safe space, and into the streets of the city. We're brought into the drama so vividly today, it can be easy to get lost in all the commotion and not know where to focus. We look around and recognize a crowd forming. The Bible says devout Jews from every nation under heaven were living in Jerusalem, and others were visiting for the festival. They all heard the wind or the sound of many languages being spoken at once, and they gathered around like a gaper's block to see what was going on. The crowd asked each other, how is it that we're able to hear these people from Galilee speaking in all of our languages. The original Greek is closer to dialects. The apostles were speaking not only in other languages, but the, the slang, the dialects of other nations. If you've ever traveled outside the U.S., you may find yourself working hard to understand someone else's language or even accent. I remember being on a bus with classmates in high school on a trip to Spain and Ireland. We were in Ireland driving along, and the bus driver was from Scotland. And he was trying to tell us about the area, and he kept saying, squelches, it's next to the squelches. After a good amount of confusion and repetition, we finally realized he was saying squares, squares. To be able to hear each other in perfect clarity, even in our own language, is a miracle. But to understand and pick up the nuances of someone else's language in their own dialect truly is an act of God. I can only imagine the people gathered together were beyond surprised. It says they were bewildered at first, then they moved to amazed and perplexed, asking, what does this mean? The crowd was divided as they tried to make sense of this unbelievable phenomenon. One group held their curiosity with openness and wonder. 
while the others sneered and said, they're filled with new wine. They came up with an explanation to satisfy their need to shut down this new thing. This is sometimes what we do in the face of something new and different. Often it takes too much energy and attentiveness, too much risk and vulnerability to open ourselves to something completely new. We would rather dismiss it as an idle tale, as the disciples did when the women shared the news of the resurrection with them. Rather than expand our imagination to include something completely foreign to us. We want so much to make sense of things that we place limits on God's words or actions to match our own inhibitions. Because with something this fantastical, fantastical, we don't know how to believe. If it doesn't fit in our boxes, we feel uncomfortable, out of our depth. We feel like we're trying to hear and make sense of a language we don't speak. This is the power and challenge of Pentecost. God is showing up in a totally new and different way. It takes suspending judgment and even reality to be open to hearing the answer to, what does this mean? We demonstrated that feeling of being slightly out of our comfort zones even today as we listen to the six people speak the reading from Acts in six different languages. It is always so cool when we have that. And yet, if you think pronouncing all those nation names in English is tough, try doing it in another language. Thanks, Joe. My gosh. Even if we don't want to admit it, we may be thinking, what did we miss? I know it's printed in English, but I was hearing something completely different. Very interesting. It's also interesting because there's something to be said for increasing our ability, our resilience, to sit in discomfort in the midst of something or someone new to us. We don't practice for the sheer sake of being uncomfortable. We do so in order to expand our image of God and who else God's Spirit is capable of inviting. When we're open to the myriad expressions of God's spirit, fire and wind, comforter, advocate, guide, and more, we can open our minds to offer a larger welcome to someone new. I think about this when it comes to recognizing who's here today, who's at the table, and who is missing. It points us to wonder who was gathered in the streets of Jerusalem that day and who was missing. I'm grateful Peter recognizes his moment and steps up to the plate. We know Peter. What else would he do besides open his mouth to speak, right? I do wonder what language did he speak in? Did the Spirit allow all who heard him to understand him in their own language? Peter speaks directly to those who were sneering. What a fun word, sneering. It feels sinister and mocking. It feels like the peanut gallery in the back of a classroom who can't help but make fun of the teacher. So Peter takes them to school. He first addresses men of Judea, then all who live in Jerusalem. He says, listen to me. I'm grateful he therefore included women in his address. These people are not drunk. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning, which is all relative, I'd say. But I learned that on a festival day at 9 a.m. in the morning, the Jewish devotees would not be eating or drinking at all. So Peter hearkens back to the prophet Joel for his interpretation of the events of the morning. This shows that the Spirit is the same Spirit of the Old Testament, and therefore connected. This new Pentecost moment is for all people. As God declares, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. The writer of Joel, therefore, says there is no limit on how old or young one has to be in order to see visions or dream dreams. Sons and daughters alike will prophesy, will predict, foretell, forecast. And one doesn't have to be liberated or free in order to receive God's Spirit poured out. 
Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Beyond what we read today, Peter continues speaking, as he does. He goes on to tell the story of Jesus and how this baptism by the Holy Spirit was a promise he gave to his people before he ascended back to the Father. The Spirit was right on time. The people were moved by Peter's speech. The community grew by about 3,000 people that day. Many were baptized in Jesus' name. The church, as we know it, was born. I think one of the points of the Pentecost story we can take away today is that God's Spirit breaks down barriers between us, even language barriers, and the Spirit surprises everyone with inclusion and belonging. When we open ourselves to this mysterious offering, the gifts of the Spirit are accessible to all, and God sees our diversity and differences not as problems to be solved but as beautiful and who God made us to be. We have to admit we love the idea of the church growing like it did on the day the apostles baptized 3,000 Christians. But we may not realize what this growth would do in changing the beloved church we've known and loved. That is again the power and challenge inherent in following the Spirit's leading. In our adult Bible study, we've been studying the book of Acts through Professor Skinner's book, Acts Catching Up with the Spirit. There have been some profound revelations we've recognized in our reading. One of them is the idea that when someone new and different chooses to associate with this faith community, our job as a congregation is not to integrate them or weave them into the existing fabric of the congregation. Skinner writes, instead, the responsibility is to recognize that everyone involved is creating something new together. The scope of you expands. You will become different from whom you were before. True hospitality occurs when hosts open themselves so fully to their guests that they allow the guests to transform them in the process. We just had this conversation this morning. We have no idea what new things the Spirit will show us along the way in our lives, in our communities, in our churches. We're blessed to take the time to discern what the Spirit is showing us through listening to God and to each other as we're embarking on this strategic planning process. How interesting the work of the Spirit, that first Pentecost, was to allow to, people to hear one another clearly. Not just hear each other's voices, but the things the apostles were speaking of, God's deeds of power. What if Pentecost is the vast and vibrant imagination of God's spirit at work in the world? I highly doubt the apostles were expecting a moment like this when Jesus said they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. This shows us there is so much more creativity and imagination involved in the Spirit's movement. What if we were able to practice sitting in the not knowing and listening intently for the Spirit's rushing wind or quiet whisper? What would it be like if we opened ourselves and our communities to God's radical inbreaking. What would that look like? Our invitation today, then, is to trust the Spirit in all her wild, unconventional, and wondrous ways. The Spirit may be calling us to risk relationship and expand our idea of community. When we do this, when we open to the Spirit guiding us, all voices could be heard and understood, young and older, beyond gender and status. And through that listening, God's deeds of power would be known and our world would be richer and more vibrant. So let's give it a try, dear church. Watch and listen for the Spirit who is poured out on all people through Christ. We will be changed for the better.